Okay, first of all, welcome everybody to this e-learning session. Uh, we're glad you could make it. Um, today we have Dr. Charles Hodges of Georgia Southern University, and he'll be talking about Keller's ARCS model of motivation. Um, I think it's a, a really interesting topic, and I think it's something that um, you know we can look at in terms of you know in class and out of class. Uh, teaching practice. Of course, you know, Dr. Hodges will be talking more about that. But uh, Dr. Hodges is a professor of instructional technology at Georgia Southern University in Statesboro, Georgia in the United States. Uh, his research is focused on online teaching and learning and teacher and learner self-efficacy related to online or technology-rich learning environments. He is the editor-in-chief of the journal Tech Trends, and he has edited and co-edited two books, Self-Efficacy in Instructional Technology Contexts and Emerging Research Practice and Policy on Computational Thinking. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Hodges, for joining us today. We really appreciate it, um, and I'm just going to hand it over to you. Okay, thank you. Uh Dr. Ames, it was really great to have the invitation to speak. Uh, good morning and good afternoon to everybody in attendance. Uh, if I'm missing anybody's time zone, I think good morning and good afternoon covers it. But uh, again, it's a real pleasure to be invited. This is a topic that I really enjoy. Uh, when I speak about it with uh, my students and, and others outside the, the world of instructional technology, they often don't know about it and they find it to be a pretty accessible uh, framework to talk about things with. So um, I will try to look at the chat box. I apologize if I miss that. Maybe somebody can alert me if I'm missing a question I, or a problem. I can do that. I can do that. Okay. Thank you. All right. So. Uh, what we're going to do is I'm going to turn on my presentation screen here. Give me a second to get that going. Okay. Can everybody see my first slide? Yes. Okay. Excellent. So, I believe the way Google Meets works, I'm off camera. Um, so somebody please let me know if I'm getting ahead of myself or something's not working. Sure will. So I'm, I'm here to talk about Keller's ARCS model of motivation. It's, I'll talk a little bit about its development and then we'll just jump right into what it is and how it can be used and then after I run through some slides, there'll be times for questions, but I'm really kind of flexible. So if somebody has a question that they just can't wait on, you know, I'm fine to, to jump in there and talk about it. So um, the ARCS model of motivation is about learner motivation. And in many ways, it's, it's kind of uh, generic meaning that it applies across a lot of contexts and a lot of learners. Um, I have selected here for this slide some photos of college age learners, adult learners, but there's no reason that it couldn't be applied in any situation. And my context is usually about uh, you know, university level, college level instruction, but this could be applied uh, in uh, human resources training, corporate training, um, young children, you know, K through 12 education. So there's, there's nothing that makes it specific to college level. What would be different would be some of the strategies and context you might use. Um, my background before the world of instructional technology was mathematics. And unfortunately, you'll find many students are not motivated 
to do their mathematics. So some of the examples that I'm going to talk about will be uh, with regard to mathematics. Um, that's why you'll hear me mention that a lot. But this is, like I said, this is really a framework that you can take and you can apply it in many different contexts and many different situations. So just a little bit of the history of, of the model. It was developed by uh, Professor John Keller, John M. Keller. Uh, there's another famous Keller in the world of instructional technology, but this is John M. Keller. He is now retired from the Florida State University. And he developed the, this model for motivational design in the 1980s. So it's certainly not brand new and it has certainly been around um, pre-online learning, uh, pre the internet, um, or the mass use of the internet in education. But I believe it still holds up and, and works across things like face-to-face -face instruction, hybrid instruction, online learning. I think it can be applied many places and I always use it in the back of my mind when I'm thinking about things. Here's a reference for the uh, original paper where this uh, model was introduced to the world. If you go online and search in an academic library uh, for the ARCS model of motivation, you'll find many papers. Um, and if this discussion this morning particularly motivates you, Dr. Keller actually has a book. Um, as he was nearing retirement, he did a great job of compiling a ton of information about the ARCS model in a book and it involves surveys and everything. So, but this is the introductory paper again from 87. So ARCS, I've, I've taken a few slides to get here, but ARCS is an acronym which stands for attention, relevance, confidence, and satisfaction. It's a uh, method for improving the motivational appeal of instructional materials. Like I said, across any domain, any content area, any delivery mode, um, you can apply this. It, of course, the four conceptual categories of attention, relevance, confidence, and satisfaction. In here, he in his original paper, he suggests some strategies. If you look those up, you'll find many of those are, are dated and in particular, especially tuned to face-to-face -face instruction because of the time period that it was developed. Um, but he developed this through a uh, basically a massive literature review of the psychology of motivation. So in the true spirit of instructional technology as a field of study, you know, we often take conceptual and theoretical things from psychology and educational psychology and apply those to work. You know, we, we in that sense, we're kind of, you know, the engineers of the learning world. We, we take the theory, we take the science and we apply it to, to do something with it. And that's exactly what uh, Professor Keller did here. Um, prior to his retirement, I actually had a, a uh, few occasions to meet him and, and uh, be involved in some group dinners and things with Professor Keller. And he was very open to talking about his, his model. And it was, it was a great opportunity to get to talk to him about it. Um, so, you know, attention, relevance, confidence, and satisfaction. We're going to dig into those a little bit as we go. People often look at these a little bit too superficially when they first see the acronym. And I've had some math professors actually tell me that uh, their summary of this when they see it is, well, I'll have the attention of the students because I'm going to be the one speaking. It's relevant to the students because they're in my class and they have to pass it. They'll gain confidence by doing the proper things in my class and they'll be satisfied when class is over. 
So I, I actually kind of laugh at that a little bit. I think it's kind of humorous. It's a very uh, quick and superficial and teacher centered uh, summary of what they think arcs might be, but there's actually a little bit more to it than that. So um, let's get into the, the four components. You may notice, you, you may think as you look at this, um, this is all common sense. And I've, I've felt that way when I saw it and, and first started a, a kind of absorbing the ARCS model. But I think one of the masterful things of, of the model is even though it is common sense, it, brings, it gives it a structure and a framework for you to think about it and a way to focus on these particular elements uh, Whereas if you were just working on, on your instructional design and delivery, uh, they may not be things that you do think about uh, intentionally. And this, this framework gives you the theoretical support through psychology and educational psychology, uh, you know, that it works. And it also gives you that framework for use. So if it seems like common sense, if it's uh, supporting things that you already do, then that's great. I think everybody likes a little external validation of their practices. So attention, this is uh, with respect to gaining the learner's attention. Of course, if you want them to be motivated and you want them to, you know, engage in the learning experience in some way, then you need to capture their attention. Um, if any of you have experience with teacher education and K-12 teacher education things, you'll often hear people talk about lesson planning and they'll, they'll say, what's the hook? And this, in a sense, is basically that hook. Uh, you're gaining the learner's attention. Now, there are various strategies for doing this. And it doesn't really matter to me if you are using something that Keller recommends or if you, through your own personal experience, have, have developed ways you think that can get the learner's attention. Um, but it is something you need to think about at the beginning of a learning experience, whether you're just, when you whether you're walking into a classroom, or whether you're designing a an, an asynchronous learning module, or something like that. So, um, here's here the few strategies are listed on the screen. Uh, providing a surprising, unexpected fact or result. Obviously, that's that's a great way to get somebody's attention. I've used that before where you, you'll ask people a question where there's an easy answer, but it's completely wrong. And you don't want to embarrass students, but you can definitely get their attention if you kind of give them that whiplash where, you know, the, there's an answer that seems like it should be obvious and it's actually incorrect. And students will be like, what, what's happening? You know, what's going on there? Uh, varied delivery. Um, this is this is mostly probably aimed at a face-to-face -face setting, but you know this is something where the, you're going to gain the user's attention if you vary your uh, vocal delivery, if you move around the room, if you use hand gestures. Um, perhaps you might use some slides on a screen, but don't read directly from the slides. Um, if you're developing videos for an online course, or if you're perhaps meeting students um, synchronously in a in a chat session, you know you don't want to be totally monotone. You don't want to be totally sitting still. Um, you may use some hand gestures and work on your uh, varied delivery just to keep people engaged. Um, Another thing I think kind of related to varied delivery is in my own personal practice, especially in online learning, you're going to lose students if you do uh, too long of a, a delivery without asking them to have some type of input. So, you know, a one hour long lecture with no breaks for questions or something like that uh, may not be the best result in terms of getting their attention. Injecting humor, you know, you can always uh, add a little bit of appropriate humor into a into a session to gain somebody's attention. It's even better, you know, if it's if it's content related. 
you do have to be a little careful with humor. If you're in an asynchronous format where body language and um, the way things are delivered may make a difference and the, the joke may not be heard or seen, uh, you also have to be careful when you're using humor across uh, different cultures. Uh, today, in this session, we have quite a uh, multi-cultural, multidisciplinary group, and I would probably not try humor myself, and unless it was something very light that might get a chuckle from people at the beginning. Uh, so humor can be used, but but appropriately. Uh, learner participation is uh, always good. Giving learners a choice in task, uh, choice in scheduling, and games and simulations are a great way to get people engaged and to get their attention that they're going to be doing something hands-on. Um, in the spirit of varying my delivery, does anyone have any questions so far? Uh, you know, I, I have a question. Uh, um, you know, for example, say if you had an async, if you were developing an asynchronous course, how often do you think it's appropriate to, to uh, you know, attempt to, you know, attract attention, or I guess attract attention is not the right way to put it, but you know, just to, to try to get the student's attention. A, f a couple times every couple of hours or of work or you know that that's a very good question and I tend to think myself in terms of uh, what I would call units or modules or uh, what some people might call chunks of instruction and I never when I design things, when I deliver uh, workshops, usually, I never really plan on students doing more, like engaging with with my content or hearing me for, say, more than maybe 10 to 20 minutes before they have an opportunity to do something else. And uh, I've taught now for many years in an asynchronous format, so I kind of use that. You know, I'm going to give them 10 or 20 minutes of, of me or 10 or 20 minutes of you know, combined of maybe a video for them to watch or things like that. But I, tr I try to tr break up the delivery through that. They may have something to read. They may have something you know, that they need to watch. So th that's another way, that very delivery with, with an online class. Um, if I'm doing... Sometimes I work with, I do workshops for professors or workshops for teachers in local schools, and I never really plan to talk a lot. I usually do introductions. I have uh, maybe them working on something, some type of task or activity, and then I might bring them all back together, you know, as I'm observing things and, and talk about some some good practices I've seen, see some common errors and discuss like that. So. I mean, probably in that respect, in terms of varied delivery and learner participation, I'm thinking probably a, no more than probably 20 minutes before I ask people to do something different. Um, even if even if that's not a game or a, or an activity, you know, maybe give them something I think they can read, and then something they can view on a video, maybe something they they can listen to to, to vary things that way, so they're changing things up. Does that help? Yeah, that, that does make sense. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Okay, if there's, if there's not anything else, I'll just move along. There, there are a couple of other questions in the chat. Oh, uh, okay. Let me pop over there and see those. Thanks for letting me know. What do we have here? Where does this attention fit in lesson flow? How is this applied in an online session? Okay, thank you for that uh, question. Looks like Adrian. Um, so I think, I mean, obviously when Keller was doing this and if you read Keller's work, 
when he talks about varied delivery, he's talking about being a good face-to-face -face presenter, basically. Uh, you, nobody wants to see that person who stands at the lectern and reads their notes. And that's kind of, I believe, what he was trying to avoid. But um, in an online session, again, I, in my own personal experience, how I try to attack this in terms of keeping attention is I'm not going to talk I'm not going to record an hour long lecture. Um, I'm going to record maybe smaller chunks of something and have students do things in between. I'm going to provide an introduction and maybe send it to, to some other resources. I'm a big believer in not reinventing the wheel. So I may provide a contextual introduction for whatever is happening in my class, but then ask them to watch a YouTube video from somewhere else or to go off and read something. And I believe that uh, can handle the kind of the varied delivery. Um, of course, in that introduction with my students, I may interject some of these other attention elements. I may, uh, I may in inject a little humor. I know who my students are usually. Um, so I, I can do that probably safely. Um, and in that introduction, I may, you know, kind of pose one of those questions with an obvious answer and just ask students to think about it uh, or even maybe pause the video before they move on and, and kind of hear the result. So I think those things are easy enough to, uh, to deliver in an online, either synchronous or asynchronous session. Uh, okay, and uh, looks like Theogene, I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly. Uh, how can you match humor and cross culture in an online class? Um, that's something that I'm aware of that people have studied. They've looked at humor across cultures. There's probably some common denominator of basic human nature that can be used. Um, I myself would be cautious of trying to use humor across cultures unless I had talked to, to some experts uh, who were familiar with the cultures I was going to be uh, working with. I, one of the, the worst things, uh, whenever I've traveled internationally, you know, I try to be very, uh, I don't want to offend anybody. I don't want to, to uh, make Americans look bad. There are other people doing that well enough. Uh, they don't need me helping them along. So I think probably the, the approach there would be to know your learners, know the, know the cultures that you're typically drawing from, and then uh, maybe discuss humor with people who know something about those cultures. Um, and Devram, uh, nice to reconnect with Devram. We were classmates long ago. Uh, how much do you believe the ability to attract attention has to do with personality? Do you also believe it requires self-awareness on the instructor's side? Well, absolutely. I mean, I think there are things that um, that you can do as an instructor um, that would not determine your personality. For example, if you're designing online instruction, you can do things like um, vary that delivery format in a video. You can vary how the students access information, maybe video here, maybe reading something there. So those are things that you, you can incorporate. But a Someone's presence and their delivery on screen or in a classroom, certainly uh, just by nature and practice, people are better. Um, some people are better presenters than others. Uh, I do think those are skills you can work on and you can develop. Um, in fact, kind of a fun story about Dr. Keller and his ARCS model. Um, I was sitting beside him as he was getting up to give his session. And when he got up to, to give a presentation at a conference several years ago, you could tell that, you know, he was a, sitting there in the session like everybody else. But as soon as he hit the, the front of the room to do the presentation, it was almost like he flipped a switch. And he was a great presenter. And I asked him about that later. I said, you know, you were, you were a really engaging speaker. And I got tickled at the... Uh, uh, the irony that would have been there if the motivational researcher was a terrible, boring presenter. And he said, don't think I didn't realize that early on. 
and I practiced and honed my skills as a presenter. So those are things that people can work on if they're if they so desire. Uh, and certainly self-awareness, you know, knowing, being able to read a room and, and your own body language can can affect that. Okay. Yes, practice, practice, practice. I was up late last night practicing this to make sure I knew what I was doing. Okay. Let's uh, move on to the next part of the acronym, relevance. Um, relevance, th this is something that I've, as a math teacher in the past, if any of you have taken math courses, which I assume probably most of you have, and any, if any of you have taught math classes, you're often faced with the question, where am I going to use this? You know, what is this good for? And I think Keller's work in this area and the development of the ARCS model really validates that question from a learner because it's one of the, the key motivating factors for relevance. It's, it's to get them, you know, how am I going to use this? What is this good for? And if you can communicate to that to them, that's going to help you gain their, uh, you know, maintain that attention that you might have already earned, but it's also going to help them see the importance of what they're learning and help them uh, work on it a little bit harder. Um, so one way to gain relevance, these are, these are strategies pulled from Keller, is to relate to, to the learner's prior experiences or future use. And, you know, I do this very explicitly in my classes. Um, I, I teach a course on evaluation, program evaluation, and, um, and product evaluation. And when students enter that class, they may not know anything about the formal study, the, the formal field of evaluation. But I'll ask them, you know, surely you evaluated something in the past. What is your prior experience? How did you choose your last television? If you were, uh, trying to book a, a vacation or, or book some travel, you know, how did you evaluate the tickets, the, the expense, the, all of these issues? And that helps them realize a little bit, oh, you know, I have done some evaluation, maybe not exactly what we're doing in this class, but I, I have evaluated things. And we, and we usually talk about how the class is going to um, fine tune and kind of formalize those evaluation practices. Or future use. This is one um, that's pretty easy. If you know the field, and for instance, most of my current students are teachers, and I can talk about, um, you know, how they're going to be able to use this or that, whatever the topic may be, in their classroom tomorrow, uh, for next year, those, those sort of things. Uh, once you get into a topic, maybe do an introduction, um, you can also ask learners to brainstorm about usefulness for themselves. And this is one of those activities that can kind of break up that delivery and help um, maintain attention as well as help them talk about relevance is just to ask them, you know, once they get into a topic, how do you think you're going to use this? Um, based on your experience in whatever profession you're in, where, where are you going to use this or where could you use it? And you know, then you can um, have them share those out with if you're face to face or online session. It's it's not hard to get them to share out information. Um, this is a great. Uh, this next one is really good, and that's guest speakers and peers. Um, bring in alumni from from a, a program. Bring in students who had previously taken your class. And if you can't bring them in, plan ahead and maybe at the conclusion of a course, ask if you have some volunteers who would give you some comments or uh, even perhaps record a short video about what they learned in the class and how it's going to help them later. Um, seeing that type of information from their, their peers, other students, can be very powerful, uh, more powerful than me telling them that they're going to be able to use this. And then simply to model enthusiasm for the content. Um, I think 
if they see that you're excited about it, then you know there must be something there. It must be working for this person. Maybe it'll work for me. Um, a lot of my research up to this point has involved uh, learner or teacher self-efficacy, and there are lots of threads in this relevance component about. Um, building up a student's confidence. And that's the next um, acronym, but it's related also to this guest speakers and peers. Not only does that allow them to see the relevance component, but it helps them gain some confidence because if people like them are saying it's good, if people like them have been successful, then that, that adds to them not only this relevance, but our next uh, category for Keller, which is, which is confidence. Um, any questions before I move on? Okay, we'll keep rolling. So, of course, it's, you know, ARCS, A-R-C-S. The next part of the acronym is confidence. This is really where my uh, professional focus has been because of my work with self-efficacy. And um, like I said, a lot of my work has been involving learner and teacher self-efficacy. And Keller noticed that is obviously self-efficacy is a huge part of educational psychology and the literature base. And getting students to have confidence with content motivates them to stick with the study and to work through hard, uh, harder content as they move along. Uh, but you have to give them some structure to allow them to, to gain that confidence. So one way you can help them gain confidence is you can explain what will be learned and how evaluation will take place. That's gonna to let them know, you know, okay, I'm gonna need to know these things and I'm going to be tested on it in this way, or I'm or, you know, this assignment will do this, and that helps them determine, helps them build confidence that yes, I can do this. You, in a sense, you're kind of chunking it out. You know, you're you're letting them know um, what's gonna what's gonna be learned and how they're gonna be tested. Unfortunately, in my background in mathematics, there are many math instructors who like to make a lot of that a mystery. And you can see that as a direct attack on the, the learner's confidence in terms of the ARCS model. Because if they're not quite sure what they're learning or why, and they're not sure how they're going to be tested, you know, it really impacts a lot of this, this ARCS model. This next one is one of my key um, recommendations when I talk to people about designing instruction. And that's just to organize the instruction in increasing levels of difficulty. Um, you may, as an attention grabbing uh, strategy, you may tell learners the type of problem they'll be solving or the type of situation they'll be working on, and they may not have all of the tools to do that at the time, but that may interest them, you know, I want to learn how to solve that problem, I want to learn how to, how to address that situation. But once they actually get into the instruction, if you hit them with something that's too hard too soon, too big, you can easily decrease a learner's confidence. It's, they just can't get through it. And I think probably if you think about your own learning experience, um, you know, breaking projects up into smaller pieces is something is a strategy a lot of people use. So if we can on the front end organize instruction so that it has increasing levels of difficulty, you're gonna help students with those baby steps, in a sense, as they move on to bigger and, and more difficult situations and problems. Um, help students set realistic learning goals. Again, you know, this is something when I talk to a student who's struggling a little bit to help them, you know, break up the bigger picture into smaller pieces that are actually achievable that as they gain success on those smaller pieces, then they get confidence that they can move on to the next one and the next bigger one. And finally, to attribute student success to their work and effort, not just chance, 
you know, you may hear students say, well, I got lucky on that one. Uh, but when you can tell that they have put in a lot of work and a lot of effort that actually paid off for them, then you should attribute their success and remind them that it was through hard work that they were able to do this. Um, that again takes a little bit of uh, discretion on the faculty members on the on the teacher's side, you know, to try to understand, you know, when someone actually did a lot of work and effort. I think we can all tell when a student has just kind of slapped something together last minute, and that's uh, probably not serving them well. But when you can tell that a student has, you know, done their research, they've worked hard on the paper, they've attended to details, and you can congratulate them and, and praise them on those types of things that have led to their success, then that helps them build confidence that they know what they're doing. Basically, if they're doing the right thing, let them know that they're doing the right thing. Okay. I do want to have some time for questions at the end, so I'm going to go ahead and go on here to the next slide. Um, and finally, satisfaction. You want students to leave a learning experience uh, pleased that they were, they were part of it and, and ready to go on to the next challenge. So one way to do that is, you know, at the very beginning, I mentioned um, real world settings, letting students know that they'll learn things in, that they'll use either right away or very soon. And one way to do that to establish satisfaction is to allow students to use your skills, their skills in authentic settings. I do this through giving my students a lot of choice to complete projects and assignments um, in their current work setting. So most of my students are professionals. Most of them are teachers or professionals in businesses. And I try to make my assignments so that they can adapt them to something that they're doing in their work so that they can see immediately, you know, I'm doing this for class, but oh my gosh, this is gonna make my next lesson better. This is gonna make something at work better. Um, and I have found this to be really uh, a great strategy to get students excited about the work that they're doing and to, to immediately see the relevance um, because you know it, it's happening, it's helping them in their job right now, so they're pretty satisfied. Also to praise success. Uh, this is another uh, takeaway from self-efficacy. You do want to make students, when it's applicable, when it's merited, you want to tell them that they've done a good job. I think teachers often has a, as a hazard of the profession, we get used to marking students' errors, but it's also important to let students know when they've had a good success. So I try to do that in my evaluation of their work and also kind of near the end of the course. Um, I do this on a kind of a unit by unit or module level because I will record a short video um, after the students have completed a major project I will record a short video maybe and tell them, you know, all of the great work that I had seen and maybe pull out a few examples because of privacy laws, you know, I don't usually name names, but I can, you know, mention great work that I had seen and, and some particular examples as, and I try to do that for the group as a whole to try to pull together common things that people did that were really good as well as mention it individually on, on papers or assignments. Um, and provide frequent positive reinforcement early, then intermittently. This is uh, standard behaviorism. Of course, you know, Keller looked at psychology and the educational psychology, and he's talking about praise here. And you need to give positive reinforcement, but if, you know, students eventually kind of clue in on that. So to make it stick, you, you know, you give them positive reinforcement early, then you start to do it intermittently to kind of break away from that um, kind of behaviorist that the learning that happens. Yeah. So that's the ARCS acronym. And Keller's model actually has 
you know, he talks about those four components, the ARCS, but you may be familiar with what's on the screen now, the uh, ADI process for instructional design. And you know, where does ARCS fit in this? Well, Keller designed ARCS to be a prescriptive model. So he's, he said, you know, if you're in an instructional situation and you notice there's a motivation problem, then you can go back and you can work through the ARCS model to incorporate those strategies to help students be motivated. And his model very much follows this kind of ADI process. You analyze the situation for motivation. Then you design some strategies that you think will help with motivation. You develop those into the course materials. You incorporate them. And you go back, you implement, and you can evaluate to see if the motivation has improved. So his motivational design model very much follows an ADI type of process. But rather than learning design, you're designing for motivation. Um, and Keller has mentioned many times that this model is a prescriptive one. But I feel like um, in any new situation where you're doing learning design, you know, part of your analysis, part of that first phase is to look at your learners. And there's usually ample literature or instructor experience that can tell you that where motivation might be a problem. For example, my previous math experience, I knew motivation was gonna be a big problem for learners. So I would just incorporate Keller's design practices with right in with my regular instructional design from the beginning, rather than wait for some motivation problem that would happen later. And I don't see any reason why you can't kind of layer it in there while you're doing your regular instructional design. Now, certainly if you have an existing course and you notice that there are motivation problems, you can go back and apply um, Keller's model and his design model, but I don't see any reason for you to wait. I usually try to think about very intentionally Keller's uh, model during my regular instructional design. Um, so here's an example of a, of a study I did several years ago. Um, we had a math course. It was not something I had designed, something someone else had designed, but we knew the students were having a lot of questions with, you know, what is this going to do for me? You know, why, why does it matter? And uh, my colleague here, Chan Min Kim, she was interested in similar things. And we designed um, motivational videos to go with the units in the math course where we specifically talked about the ARCS components. So we would gain their attention by uh, alerting them to something that they had done in the past. One of the examples I remember is we were talking about uh, gas mileage in a car. So everybody was concerned about how much gas they're using. You know, do you want to have a car with a lot of gas or not? And, you know, that made it, that might have gained their attention when we talked about the price of gas. And it also addressed relevance because to them they might, you know, oh, actually math, you know, this math course, this algebra course could help me do this. And as we worked through some examples with them in these videos, short videos, like five minutes, we actually were able to gain positive effects at the end of the course with the students who received those treatments felt like the course was much more uh, relevant and they were much more interested in the material when we applied that kind of real world uh, arcs relevance piece to it. Okay, so that's the end of the slides. I'm gonna go ahead and cut the slides off, but now I'm just here for questions. It looks like there's a comment in the the chat box there. Uh. Okay, so from uh, let's see, not a question, but a comment from Devram Ozdemir. Uh, based on my personal experience, empathy was the most difficult part for faculty to create relevance. Um, I think empathy is certainly important for instructors to have. And even more so during the uh, 
shutdown most of us have seen with the pandemic across the world as you just need to empathize with your learners. Um, maybe, maybe Dever, maybe you could, could explain a little bit about uh, empathy and relevance. Sure. Um, thank, thank you. As, uh, I work with hundreds of accountable institutions as an instructional designer, and every time I was sitting at the at the table with an instructor designing their instruction, in, intentionally or unintentionally, they were external externalizing themselves from the instructional context and focusing more on um, instructional content rather than the learning experience. And when we were thinking about identifying the learning objectives, um, they were trying to create objectives for themselves as an instructor, ah. you know, versus putting themselves in students' shoes and thinking about for a two-week period with no prior knowledge what is relevant and reasonable <laughs> for students to learn and accomplish at the end of the course. That's what I meant with empathy, being able to put yourself into the student's shoes, their context, their situation, and then work backward in a way to create the relevance to their culture or to their um, generation, perhaps. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, thanks for clarifying that comment, Devram. I totally agree. Um, I often see uh, that kind of lack of empathy to be more likely in faculty from the sciences. They they seem to have this uh, more pure science approach where they think you know their their content is king, and that students should more adapt to them. Uh, but I I agree you sh you should definitely think about your learners. You should think about what they need, the situations that they're in for you know. Uh, many people teach graduate level courses for working adults and you need to have, I'm not saying you need to make the classes easier, but you need to make them, um, you know, so that they can gain some confidence, chunk things out so that they, you think that they can do it in shorter sessions that they might have as a working adult rather than thinking that they can spend an entire day on something. So... Uh, yes, and let's see, Adrian says, uh, does motivational design come before the instructional design process or is it embedded? Um, I actually, I mean, I believe it, sh it should come embedded with it. Maybe not, you know, as a, as a major component, but it's something that you should think about as you do your instruction and it can come after. Um, I don't usually see it would come before the instructional design process, but I, I could be not thinking of a situation where that would happen. But usually motivational design is going to occur because you have a learning experience where you feel motivation is a problem, or you're designing a situation where you suspect it might be a problem. Um, so that's, that's kind of where it falls in for me. And, um, you know, if, if this interests you, there are a couple of different, um, Keller has a couple of surveys. I mean, there have been many, many researchers who've done this, so you can find many things, probably applicable right to your uh, content area. But Keller also has a couple of standard surveys. He's, he has a course interest survey that people use to do research on with the ARCS model. And he also has a, a another, course material motivation survey, two of them. Um, one's more about the content of the course and one's more about the, kind of the whole course experience. But um, so surveys, you know, is a way to, to measure and determine whether or not you've improved things by applying the ARCS model. That's what we used in the example I shared about the math course with the these motivational videos. Ah, now Ezra, uh, Devram says, can you share some best practices to help students leave or finish the course with maintained motivation to seek further learning? 
that is definitely an important aspect. You want your students to leave excited about the course and you want to want them to leave wanting more. And I think if you intentionally look at the ARCS model and you attend not just to that final satisfaction piece, but you know, if you've got them interested with the attention, if you give them the relevance aspect so that they can see it's applicable and uh, the confidence, you know, where you've, you've helped them along to gain some confidence there, um, the end result would be that they would be wanting to seek further learning. One issue, and this is something that this session was too short to talk about, is developing those authentic, relevant learning experiences. Um, going back to math, I think many people have done, as a student, they've completed word problems or story problems. Some people call them in a math course. You know, you, two painters paint a house, you know, or, or two cars leave a city, one's traveling this fast, one's traveling that fast. And the intent of a lot of those problems is to gain learners' attention or to see some relevance. Unfortunately, they're just not well designed. And the students may look at those and go, well, I'm not painting a house, I'm not driving a car uh, between two cities. So one aspect that can really help with that question of seeking further motivation is making sure that the relevance and, and the attention aspects that you have used are authentic and real so that the students can actually see the applicability of these things later. Uh, if you have kind of what I would call these contrived situations um, where students are going to see right away, well, this doesn't apply to me, you know, wh what is this stuff he's making up? Uh, so staying engaged with uh, practitioners in your area so that you can actually construct good cases or pulling cases from case studies, those kind of things can help. Um, okay, Florence says, e-learning has a possibility of being very dry and impersonal. So I think the skills to stay engaged with students, keep up enthusiasm, um, we would err on thinking that just because we teach, that's correct. Um, uh, if there are some recommendation for us traditional teachers, what would that be so as to improve e-learning? Well, um, I think all of the things we just discussed with Keller's ARCS model, all of those are great strategies and you may focus in a particular situation more on one component than the other. Um, for instance, you know, uh, Maybe you spend a lot of time up front working on gaining attention and relevance, and you think that um, the confidence and satisfaction aspects will come out from the work on those two um, through the grading and feedback that you give the students. So I think those pieces can be implemented into e-learning uh, effectively. I also am a big fan in terms of you know, helping students gain confidence in terms of chunking. And that is, you know, making modules that they can be successful with. Um, one example from my own experience, and this, um, I used to assign work to my students over one week pieces. And for my students, the one week seemed rushed and it, um, it stressed them out and they would have trouble with kind of with the confidence and satisfaction parts because they felt stressed and rushed. And this is another like, falls back to the empathy that uh, Dr. Ozdemir mentioned. Um, I changed my practice and went to making my course modules in my online courses be two week blocks. I still give them the same co content that I was asking them to do in those two weeks, but I give them particular pacing and that there's something about them looking at the two week module and thinking, okay, I have two weeks to do these things rather than I have one week to do these things and one week to do these things. And that really uh, helped the students in, in, in my situation. 
Uh, okay. You all are being very interactive and having some great questions, which makes me happy. Uh, I've done a few sessions this summer uh, for other, other locations, and you kind of feel like you're just talking into a black hole and it goes down the internet never to return. Do you want to take this want this last question and we'll just say like that'll be the last since we're getting close to the end of the hour here or okay sure uh, let's see Linda says do you lock them down so they can only see two weeks at a time or do you open up the entire course I think that is a uh, <laughs> I, I'll cop out there and I'll say I think that's a personal decision um, for me I have I have done things in both ways. I have opened courses up entirely, and I have I move things along in chunks. Usually, if it's a course where most of the work is done by an individual, then I'm okay with opening the entire course. I do have to let the learners know that I'm going to be on a schedule with the course. So if you happen to be four weeks ahead and you've submitted work four weeks before I'm going to get there, I'm not going to grade your work early because of a kind of an efficient workflow. I'm going to grade the work with everybody when they turn it in. So that actually could impact some of their confidence and satisfaction if they're doing that work that far in advance and not getting any feedback. So that is a danger there. But I try to to ward that off by letting the students know, you know, you you're, are available to work ahead, but you're going to be missing out on that, um, uh, that piece. Uh, in other courses where I have group assignments and things a little bit more sequenced, I will only open those up kind of a module at a time, so kind of two weeks at a time. Um, oh, and I see here Linda has said, it's not about working ahead, it's about understanding where the course is going. Um, I provide for my students a pretty detailed, what I call a course at a glance. Uh, other people might call it just a course schedule, but I, uh, it shows, you know, the modules, the dates, uh, major assignments when they're due, those kind of things. So perhaps that would help, help you, Linda, with kind of seeing where it's going. Uh, but I, I do feel sometimes it's, it's important to control when they're doing things and when they might be asking for feedback, because if they wait too long, that confidence and satisfaction components can be impacted. But that's my personal style. Different teachers, different students, it may be different. So, okay. Thank you, Alicia. Um, all, all right. Um, I just wanted to say thank you so much, Dr. Hodges. I think this is a fascinating topic, and I'm not just saying that because you're here. Um, you know, I think it, a lot of the pieces of it really get to the heart of the creative aspects of instructional design, you know, where you're thinking about, you know, how can I, humor or attention and just these, these pieces where you can really, yeah, you know, be creative, you know, with, with your project. So I really like, you know, that part of it a lot, you know, but, but thank you very much. Well, it, it was a pleasure to be here. This is a topic that I love to talk about, and it's even more fun when you can get people like a working session and people can be working on things and trying to figure out how to tack this into a class and people are sharing ideas and talking back and forth. It's a, it's a really yeah. good kind of a workshop thing, but it was, it was great to be here, and I hope everybody has a good rest of the day and everybody stays safe from this nasty virus. Thank you again. Yep, thank you.